God. Our God does reign. Yes, amen. For those of you that were able to get to be with us on Tuesday night to be uh, to give honor to uh, Sonny, it was a great time. We had a great time there. Yes, sir. <clears throat> First time I've been out on one of the Ship Island ferries in a long, long time. And uh, it was a joy. The weather was nice outside. It was cooler upstairs than it was downstairs to me uh, in the air conditioning. It was a nice breeze and everything. And uh, we were able to honor Sonny and honor the Lord. Give glory to God through what Sonny did, through the way he lived his life. And it was a privilege and honor to be there and be a part of it. And there were a lot of influential people there. Uh, of course, the Monroe, Sonny Monroe, uh, was one of the influential families, or is one of the influential families here on the coast. And all the rest of them joined in. So uh, I thought it was a blessed time. And uh, it was great to compare what the way that Sonny lived his life to giving glory to the Lord. Amen? Because he did. He did. He, he gave glory to God. It did not matter right up until the last. He was here revving his engines and ready to go and uh, giving God glory and praise even in the midst of stage 4 cancer just two weeks before he passed. He was here giving God glory. Isn't that amazing? And not coming up for prayer for himself. He always wanted to pray for someone else. And I'd have to call him up. He'd come up here for prayer, and I'm going, okay, he's coming up for prayer for healing. No. Oh, pray for my wife. Pray for this one. Pray for that one. i got a friend that's, that's sick or something. And I said, well, can we pray for you? For what? what, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, that. you can pray for that too. Okay. Just cancer. You know, it didn't bother him. He didn't let it get him down. He gave glory to God no matter what. In the midst of the trouble, right? Yes. So today... As soon as I get my voice back from singing, praise God. <laughs> we had it going on here this morning, praise God. It was a fun time. <clears throat> but uh, praise God. We come to give God glory and honor here today. Amen. Let's go before Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for Your Word. Lord, we open ourselves up to receive Your Word here today, Lord God. We come before Your throne of mercy and grace giving you glory and honor and say, yes, Lord, we receive your word here today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Yes, Lord. August 19th, my goodness, we're coming right along here. The, the year's more than halfway done. And the, the, uh, the young lady here, the eight-year-old, I asked her how old she was. She says, eight. And she said, well, almost on August the 30th, next week. And uh, I said, wow, mine's the 31st. Isn't that something? So we almost share one right there. Isn't that something? Praise God. We want to talk today about <clears throat> doing what the Word of God has to say. And it says to have this thing work, and it's working great. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. We heard that somewhere before? Yes, sir. I've heard that somewhere before. Love your neighbor as yourself. Is that something we do all the time? We kind of put num numero uno as numero uno. We like to, to look after ourselves before, and then I've got something left over, then I'll, I'll share with you. I'll, I'll love you too as long as I've got myself covered first, right? But that's not the way Jesus says it. As a matter of fact, we read in, in Luke, I chose Luke, all three of the Gospels and Synoptics have an account of this, but in Luke 10, 25, it says, Behold, a certain lawyer kid stood up and tested him. Now, lawyer isn't what we tend to think of it in today's society. This was a, a, an expert in the law of Moses, right? So he knew what he was talking about. Stood up and tested him. Isn't that great? You know, test God. Only thing that God ever said to test him in is given the, 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 off, the tithes and the offerings, right? The only thing he ever said to him. But he wanted to test God Almighty. Not a brilliant thing to do, but he did it anyway. Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, and he said to him, Jesus said to him, what's written in the law? What's your reading, reading of it? Talking to this expert in the law of Moses, what do you, what's written? What do you think? So he said, he answered and said, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now in the other Gospels, the other synoptics, it says uh, the first is love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. And the second is like it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the whole sum of the law is summed up in that. Uh, and it's interesting because it starts out, I'm the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, right? You shall have no other graven images or anything like that. It's to love the Lord your God. And all the rest of them go on. We shall not commit adultery, offend another person. We shall not steal their goods. We shall not covet their goods. We shall not covet their wife. We shall not do this and that. Shall not lie to one another. Everything else is in our dealings with one another. And the Lord showed me last week that we tend to have the first part kind of, sort of, okay, in that we love the Lord our God. I don't know about all the strength and, and all your mind and soul and heart and everything else, because a lot of times we tend to love number one more than we love anyone else. But that, that one we can kind of wrap our head around, right? That we want to love God with everything we've got. And once you get to know Him, the more you get to know Him, the more He is revealed to us. And that's the main thing. He gets revealed more and more to us as we grow in Him. And we should never, ever stop growing in the Lord. Amen. Because we know just a speck of what He is. And how amazing He is. So we come, once we get to know Him more and more and more, we fall more and more in love with Him. We see His provision for our life. We see the way He works in our life. It amazes me to see the things that he does over and over again. I'm just amazed. Every day we sit and are amazed at the things that God has done through our life. This week has been an interesting week for Cindy and I. Uh, interesting week would be a, an understatement. She had surgery on her neck, as you know, not long ago, three and a half weeks ago now. And all of a sudden the incision on her neck opened up. Uh, on I think it was last weekend we're still trying to figure out when it actually did it but we went to one doctor on Monday that had done, had done another procedure on her and he says well you know it'll, it should grow back over and everything uh, we just need to wait and see what will happen and uh, <clears throat> then we went to the surgeon that did it on Thursday and he got very concerned and uh, said, oh my goodness, we may have to do surgery on Saturday, emergency surgery on Saturday, and oh boy, we, don't, we need to make sure we had to run all over the coast, getting different tests done and MRIs done and all this kind of stuff. Come to find out that everything was fine. Uh, no infection. He was concerned about infection getting in there and getting infected in the appliance he put in the, in the back of her neck. Uh, and uh, there's no problem, praise God. But uh, just just something to get you revved up, something else to go running all over the place at the last second doing different things. Mm -hmm. But uh, praise God, there was nothing wrong. And this morning, I looked very carefully at it, and it's closed. Uh, it's closed up, praise God. And isn't that something that healed back up just that fast? So God Almighty has got us in the palm of His hand and see that as we get to know Him more and more, we realize the things that He does in our life and we start lo loving Him more and more because we realize how much He loves us. But what about our loving our neighbor as ourselves? My goodness, far too often we kind of miss the second part of it. And the other eight commandments deal with our relationship with other people. Verse 2 to, in, involves our relationship with Him. And eight of them are this way. Isn't that something? Well, praise God. We're going to take a look at what it says about loving our neighbor as ourselves. Let's finish up with this particular story. And Jesus said to him, You've answered, answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. Wow. Wow. Do this and you will live. Sometimes we wonder, okay, uh, what, what do I, well, he asks, what do I need to inherit eternal life? We need to love him and we also need to love our brothers. 
If we're missing one part of this, our life isn't complete. It's not complete. We need the, the upward and we need the cross as well, right? We need the, the relationship with him going up, but we also need the relationship with our brothers and sisters. So I want to have life and life abundantly, right? That we may have life and life abundantly. Sometimes we get off on our own thing and we don't know, we miss out on too much. <clears throat> but let's see his response. But he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself. Said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Kind of like, what a dumb question is that, right? What kind of a dumb question is that? But he wanted to make, see, he's, a, he's an expert in the law. He wanted to make sure he got it exactly right to where he could follow it to the letter, make sure he's doing just exactly right. But Jesus answered and gave him a, a, a parable. So a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. This was a 17-mile trek from Jerusalem to Jericho. And says so he went down because it's, it's dropping down. Jer uh, Jerusalem's up on high and Jericho's down lower. And through it's a winding road and it's got many caves all around it. And so the thieves would very easily hide in the caves. And when they come down through this little valley, they'd jump on them and steal all their stuff. Very easy to get set up there. So... I'd have gone somewhere else. Well, I'd gone somewhere else first and then to Jericho myself, but that's the way they had to do it. So he went down there and he fell among thieves. <clears throat> Who wasn't too nice to him? Stripped him of all his clothes. That's a rude thing to do. I mean, come on. If you're going to beat the man up and steal his stuff, please don't take all his clothes and leave him there naked, you know. But that's what he did. They, they stripped of his clothes and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Kind of like a hit and run today. Hit and run, they really get upset about it. You know, if you get in a wreck, it's one thing, but you do a hit and run, you're in real trouble. And this was basically their idea of a hit and run back then, right? Mm -hmm. There he is, probably had, a, had some kind of animal, I don't know, it doesn't say. But they left him half dead, my goodness. Bad enough, you got to steal and all that sort of stuff, but man, then you go beat him, stripping him and everything else. Just to degrade him, just to make it that much worse. And of course, now by chance, interesting, by chance, a priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now here's a priest. <clears throat> this is a Levite of the order of Aaron, who is now in do, doing the offerings, doing the actual sacrifices and everything, right? And he sees him. And by saw, it means just kind of a glancing blow. He saw, looked at him, and he just kept on trucking on over here. He kind of, let me get out of this way here. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. So he passed by on the other side of the road. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Now, the Levite, uh, the priests were Levites as well, but they were just descendants of Aaron so that they were the ones that did the actual sacrifices and all this. Now, the Levites were basically what we would call your deacons in today's society, in, the, in today's church, in that they took care of the physical needs. They took care of the animals, for one thing, herding all these animals in for sacrifices, carrying them back out, cleaning up all the mess, taking care of the sanctuary. They're the ones who swept the place and kept it all up and all that kind of stuff. Someone that's working with their hands, basically, and they were serving God and serving the people at the same time. So this man was a man that was used to getting his hands dirty, used to getting his hands in blood and everything else, right? But he comes and he looked. He didn't just kind of get a glancing look and keep on going. This guy came over and looked at the man and checked out what was going on. Gives more of a glare. He did a, a good inspection of what was happening. And he saw this man naked, beaten half to death and laying there on the side of the road. And he passed by on the other side of the road. My goodness. What a shame, right? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. Now again, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Absolute loathed by the Jews because they had committed adultery, if you will, with the Assyrians when they came in and took over 
their land, they associated with them and assimilated into their culture. They married their children and gave their, their daughters and sons uh, to marriage with the Assyrians and they intermixed with them. So the Jews considered them half-breeds and they did not like them. They hated their guts. They, they considered them apostates for giving up the worship of God alone and gone to be with the, the Baals, B-A-A-L, Baal or Baal, however you want to pronounce it. And they gave up their everything, spiritually, physically, everything. They gave up their right as children of God. So they despise these people. And here, a Samaritan comes along, and he sees this Jew standing there, or laying there, rather. And he's the one who has compassion on him. Not the man of God, the, the, the priest, not the, the Levite, the deacon, if you will, but someone that they had very much animosity between them. And he comes and has compassion. He reached out to his brother. We need to have, do we have compassion when we see our brother or our sister in hurt? Right? Yes. Do we have compassion on them? Do we look at them and say, I'll help? Maybe it's someone, we're not all going to be best friends. It's just the way it is. Everybody in here is not going to be just your best bud you ever met and want to hang out with you all the time, and you're not going to want to hang out with them every time you see them and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. But what about someone that, that, you know, everyone's got different personalities, and you find someone that, well, okay, and there's my brother uh, that's having a hard time, and I need to help this brother. I need to help this sister, and I need to have that compassion that is there. Rather than, not even if it's your enemy, even if it's someone that hates your guts, that has a hard time with you. So, he has compassion on this man. So we went to him. So we went to him and bandaged his wounds. Did he carry a bunch of band-aids with him or something? I don't know. Did he, or did he take his own clothes and tear them up and bandage his wounds? Doesn't say... But I don't know who in the world walks around with bandages all the time. And he poured oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. He, he bandaged his wounds. So somehow either he had bandages or he tore up his own clothing. Because that man's clothing was gone. And bandaged him up. He poured oil and wine, which are very valuable commodities back then. Right? He gives, pours oil and wine, which was to be a medicine, what they had back then, to start the healing process, to cleanse it and to start the healing process. And again, something that was valuable to him, something that he needed himself, but he gave it to his brother, who wasn't even a so-called brother uh, to him. And he set him on his own animal. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this man was obviously riding a donkey or riding some sort of an animal, and now he gets off his animal, puts this other guy on his, now he's walking while this guy's riding his animal. If he had a horse or something, a lot easier to ride something than it is to, to walk alongside, right? Mm -hmm. Put him in his own car, let him drive. Brought him to an inn, <clears throat> and... <coughs> Excuse me. Again, I don't know what the price of, of well, I, from what I understand, it's it's about a, a twelfth of a denarii, uh, which we give about 21, 24 days, which we'll see here in just a minute. But it, the cost of, of uh, a motel room these days, over $100 a night, just blows my mind. I can't understand it right, myself. It's a, it's a place to lay your head and then take a shower in the morning, right? And it's $120 to $150 if you're lucky. You go to a lot of places and it's it's well over two, three, four hundred dollars. Some of them are thousands of dollars for the night for a place to sleep. I don't get it. Uh, when Cindy and I were first married, Hotel Six was the end thing. It was new. And the six meant meant six dollars. It had six dollars a night. And they then they came out with, with Super Eight. It was the eight days in, and it was eight dollars a day in, and we couldn't figure out why would anyone pay an extra two dollars a night for
but to spend the night there, right? We'd always find the Motel 6 anytime we could. But, uh, but whatever the cost was, it was expensive. It's expensive to stay in an inn. And he took care of him there. So then on the next day, <clears throat> when he departed, he had to go on to, to his own destination. He took out two denarii, which would be about 24 days worth of room and board there, and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of it. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. My goodness, he's really coming off of putting himself in, in a place of really putting himself in, in inconvenience, right? Giving up that much. If we were to do, well, let's see, if it was, if you got a $100 a night, that's equivalent of giving $2,400. If you got it for 100 bucks a night today. Right. He gave a lot of money. He gave his own oil and wine. He gave his own animal for that man to ride on. I mean, this man really went out of his way and said, whenever I come back, I'm going to be coming back through here next Tuesday or whatever. And uh, when I come back, if you spent more than this, I'm going to give you some more money to cover. Man, this guy was a friend, right? I mean, he went out of his way to take care of this. So Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Who was his neighbor? And look at the answer. He said, to him who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Interesting, Jesus says, okay, you got a, a, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Did he say the Samaritan did it? He didn't say that. He said the one who showed mercy. He couldn't even bring himself to say that the Samaritan did it, you know? <laughs> he didn't even want to admit that a Samaritan could do something good, something nice, especially for a Jew. They thought they hated anyone and everyone. There was so much animosity there. Interesting that the uh, lady at the well, the woman at the well, right, that Jesus met and said, give me a drink of water, that was in Samaria. She was a Samaritan woman, and she says, what are you doing talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. Obviously, they could tell one another, well, he was in Samaria. He went through Samaria. He says, I must needs go through Samaria uh, to get to Jerusalem. So he went through Samaria. It's the quickest way, really, but they would always go around it because they hated him so much, right? Uh, and he says, well, you know, if you knew who was offering, asking for a drink of water, you would ask me for some water, is what he said. And she ends up getting saved. She says, I found, she went and became an evangelist immediately, right? Ran into town and says, guess what? I found the Messiah. But God showed mercy to her. And now this man won't even mention the fact that the, it was a Samaritan that did the good deed. He showed mercy on the one that was hurt. And he's told him, go and do likewise. Take care of your brother. Have compassion on your brothers and sisters. Have compassion on anyone that's in hurt, right? Anyone that's been hurt or in need. My wife has a lot better eyes to see a lot of these things a lot of times. Uh, I tend to, to see something, and just being honest with you, I'll see it. I'll, I'll recognize it down deep, but I tend to keep on going. I'm, I'm in a hurry to get somewhere. So a lot of times I tend to be like the other guys, right? Anyone else relate to that? Not your head like that. Yeah, because you can too, right? We tend to, to move on down the road. I'm in a hurry. I've got to get someplace. And i got a doctor's appointment. i got whatever it is. My wife's the one that will stop and say, hey, wait a minute. And I'll go, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's why I have her to complete me. Because I ain't even quite half of me by myself, right? I'm a little... Amen, brother. Yeah, thank thanks for not amening me on that one, but yeah. But, uh, but praise God, we need to have our eyes open and our hearts open, right? We need to have our hearts open to what's going on in our brothers and our sisters' lives. Because we know good and well that in this world today, there's a lot of hurt going around. Like I shared on Wednesday night, there was a survey that someone did, I saw in the paper, or heard on, I think I heard it on the radio, saying that 80% uh, that of the people in this country today are, are 
consider themselves uh, quite stressed about their lives and what's going on in this country. Stressed about the way things are going. There was another shooting in another Walmart just the two or three days ago. Isn't that amazing? Shooting in a Walmart. You can't go anywhere without there being some idiot that's wanting to shoot everybody in the place. And uh, let alone all the different things that keep ha keeps happening. Uh, I imagine everyone here knows that it's hurricane season because they won't let you forget it on the news. Right? Every night they got a new thing about the hurricanes and everything else and how many more that's coming and oh my goodness this system's out there and everything else. Praise God that they can forecast it and we got some, some heads up, right? But uh, the, the different stresses that are on the lives, the wildfires, my goodness, there's last I heard, which was several days ago, well over a thousand homes destroyed. And I don't know if you ever had a house destroyed by fire, it leaves nothing. It leaves absolutely nothing. Everything that you own is gone. And over a thousand of them, and these houses that they show are just gorgeous, big, beautiful homes and completely destroyed. There is a lot of stress in this world today. Tornadoes and the, the rain and the hail and how much flooding has there been? One place had eight inches of rain in like six hours, I think it was, or something like upstate that. Upstate New York. Yeah, upstate New York, yeah. Uh, my goodness, things just going crazy around us. That's what amazed me again about after Hurricane Katrina, God sent in the troops from all over the country coming down here to help us. And I don't know where in the world this place would have been without all of the people coming in to help us after Hurricane Katrina, right? I mean, there was thousands of people coming in at the time. Uh, churches were full, a lot of churches were full with people coming in and setting up shop. We were attending a church in the Agraville at the time, and every Sunday they would, they would have to move all the blankets and the pillows and everything against the wall because they were coming and sleeping in the sanctuary. Uh, and the place would just be jam-packed because over half the people there would be people from around the country that had come to work. And they were going in and mucking out people's houses, walking through the mud and, and working in hot, hot, hot. People were there. God came out and brought his people out, and they had compassion on us. But that's great when we have an issue like that, right? But what about in our everyday lives? We look at our brother or our sister and see some hurt in them. Do we just walk on down the road? Or do we... Say, hey, what's going on, man? How can I help? What's going on? Can I pray with you? Uh, just some uplifting words. And again, we need to be careful as to what comes out of our mouths so easily. We offend someone. And sometimes we don't realize it. Sometimes we may realize it. I'm helping you because I'm going to show you the plank in your eye. Well, they got a splinter, they got a splinter in your eye. You need to get the plank out of yours before you go, jumping all over your brother or sister showing them what's wrong with their life, right? I'm going to help you and show you how to, to do this or do that. No, no. How about some uplifting? Hey, I know you're in a, a world of hurt and I know what's going on and, and you need this and that. And I'm just coming here to tell you that God Almighty is on your side. We're going to pray together right now. I like the way Donita says, I'll, I'll pray for you, brother. You know, and by the time you get home, you don't forgot who it was. I don't even, did I see them today? I don't even think I saw them today. No. Let's stop and pray right now, right? I want to pray for you while we're on the phone. I want to pray for you while we're right here. And have that compassion on our brother or sister. Look at uh, John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment, Jesus speaking, right? My is, is capitalized. This is my commandment that you love one another as I love you. My goodness commandment from God Almighty, the only real commandment that He gave us in the New Testament, commanding us to love one another. And love is not an emotion. It's all this all gooey and, you know, all wonderful. It's not just that. Praise God for the gooey. I like the gooey. But it's, it's a commitment. 
It is, I will be here for you. That's why the, the marriage vows are such as they are. You know, in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad and everything else, I'm going to be here, I'm going to stick through this. It does not matter. Far too often that doesn't get held up in today's society. It continues to go downhill. But that is the commitment that we make. And what, when things go wrong in our marriage and in our married life, we continue to stick through it and we keep plugging through. And I'm going to be here. I said I was going to be here. And I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to be running off and, and going about my own business. Jesus says greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. Now, he was being prophetic here that he was about to lay down his life literally and be killed for us, for our sins, right? But if I'm laying down my life, that man that was in that parable right there that we just talked about, he laid down his life for him. He took time out of his schedule to stay with that man and take care of him. He took time to, to get his hands bloody by taking that man up in his arms and, and holding him. Took some of his own goods, perhaps his garments, I don't know, but definitely his own oil and wine to, to pour on his wounds. He took time to put him on his own animal while he walked. He took a lot of his own money that he had worked for and gave it to him to make sure he was there. He laid down his life. He put his life on hold. Right? And Jesus says, greater love is no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. We need to make sure that we are following what he says. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, greater, you are my friends if you do what I command. Ah, that's the next verse from that. <laughs> if you want to love me, uh, you need to love your friends, your, ne your neighbors as yourself. And you are my friends. I want to be the friend of Jesus. Amen? Amen. If we do what he commands. I want to do what he says. I want to have my heart open to what my brother and sister is in need of. Watching out for them. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If we're not doing it, see, if we're not putting feet to our faith, that's one thing, again, I said the other night at, at uh, Sonny's funeral was that Sonny put feet to his faith. Yes. He always, from what I heard, see, again, we got the end of Sonny, with, where he was already down a whole lot of weight and, and uh, all his money had been basically taken away uh, by supposed friends and relatives. And uh, But uh, he kept giving. He kept giving. He put put his faith out there, put his uh, feet to his faith. When he had money, he was constantly giving money to different charities and giving it to different churches and to people in need. He just gave and gave and gave. And then someone ups and sues him. They need to read the Word of God. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 6? What are you doing carrying brothers and sisters into the, into the uh, courthouse and suing one another? But they don't do that. They claim to be believers, but they don't do that anyway. They need the word, read the Bible that they claim to be a Christian of, right? A follower thereof. But it didn't matter. He kept giving and giving and giving. And he continued to do what the Word of God said. Are we putting action to our faith? I need to be doing what it is, not just hearing it. Oh, we can come and listen to it all day long and walk out here and forget it all, right? My dear old dad said, uh, what did he say? Live and learn, die and forget it all, right? Sometimes we come here and learn and walk out and forget it all. But are we actually receiving the word? Are we actually saying, yep, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry out what the word God had to say here. Yeah. A little bit further in James. So see, I woke up. I, I preached too loud. I'm sorry, sister. But uh, James 2.14, just a little bit further down, what next uh, chapter says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? 
Can faith save him? If you're not doing what you claim to, to say you believe, what does it profit you? If you say you've got the, we can speak all you want. We can talk a good talk, but do we walk the walk that follows it? Well, brother, sister, and this is the next verse. This is his uh, analogy that he's given. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you don't give them the neat things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? I've got the ability to help you, but I don't do anything about it. What good is that? I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a hypocrite. Jesus didn't like the hypocrites much, did he? Constantly got in their face about being a hypocrite. And that was the religious leaders of the church, right? The priests and the Pharisees, the chief priests, scribes, Pharisees. He didn't want us to say with our mouth, I'll be praying for you, brother. You know, I'll be praying for you. Go in peace. Be warm. Be filled. No. I need to be there for my brother and my sister. That's also faith by itself. If it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. If we're not putting feet to our faith and Someone can see by our actions. The old saying goes, if you're uh, put in jail for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested for being a Christian right now, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? And far too often, that would have to be no in a lot of people's case. A lot of people in this world, in this country, claim to be Christians. Mm -hmm. But very, very few of them actually follow the Word of God. It's amazing to me. Uh, sit there and claim, a lot of them claim to be born-again Christians. But yet they don't follow the Word of God. What good is that? That does nothing. They need to be following along in their footsteps, doing the Word that they claim that they believe in their heart. Faith by itself is dead if it doesn't have the, the faith the followers to to go to do about it new living translation says that says it this way so you see faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds i like the way it says that unless it produces good deeds Thank it's you. dead and useless yeah the message says yeah Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Outrageous nonsense. I love it. Without acts, yeah. without doing something, it's outrageous and it's nonsense or it's dead and it's useless. This does no good whatsoever if we do not do the things. Yeah. And Again, now we've been preaching about faith and, and grace, right? We've been preaching about grace. We're under God's grace. We will get to heaven uh, by God's grace, amen? But tell, I tell you what, there are different things that's going on here uh, that we need to be aware of. My, my salvation doesn't depend on my acts. My salvation depends on my faith in Him to cover my sins, right? Yeah. But... We will find out here in a minute that there are rewards that are there for what we do here on this earth. Now, someone may argue. No, people wouldn't argue. Yes, they would constantly. Constantly argue over the word. Some people have faith. Others have good deeds. So, you know, you do stuff and I've got my faith. And that's what the deal is there. But, and this is the rest of the same verse, right? But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? How can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds to prove it? How can I show? You're going to show me by what you do. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Again, this is the New Living Translation. I love the way it just lays it out there flat, straight. And you can't sit there and debate about it, right? But people want to argue. But you show me your faith. If you don't you have good deeds, it's not going to happen. You can't sit there and prove that you've got all that. 
Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Ah, Jesus is going to come, and we as believers are going to stand before Christ. And we will be rewarded according to the works we've done, the things that we have done. We will get into heaven. Yes, we'll get there. As a matter of fact, let's see, did I put it in here? No, I didn't put it in here. One says, uh, yeah, we'll get there by our faith, but it'll be as one that's singed. <laughs> right? One that's been singed. You'll smell like smoke because you didn't do anything with it. I want to do something with it. I want there to be evidence that I was a believer while I was here. That there's other people that can say, well, Jesus said, even if you give as much as a cup of water to one of these little ones, you've done it unto me. Right? If you've, done, uh, if you've given them a bite to eat or given them a cloak to wear, given them anything, done something physically here on this earth, you've done it to him. Uh, again, a friend of mine, Jimmy Fayard, one of the owners, or founders of Fayard's BP stations, uh, a number of years ago, he passed away, golly, I guess it's been almost 10 years ago now, six, seven years ago anyway. And uh, he always was giving out food and everything. They made po' boys and, all, and had a meat market and all that kind of stuff, but he was always giving out stuff. I was there at, after Hurricane Katrina uh, and they had a generator run in their place and there were one of the few gas stations around. And I was standing there talking to him because I went to school with him. And uh, he was, uh, we were talking about different things and uh, a lady came up that he grew up with uh, that I didn't really know her but he knew her, a cousin I think it was. And she says, I don't have any money, I don't have enough money for gas and something to eat to we needed such and such uh, something for the baby or something and he told his brother says fill up her gas tank completely give her what she needs out of there and then bring her home some steaks too out of the meat market he says today you're going to eat the best filet mignon you ever ate and he and wouldn't take any of her money and came over there and she she had lost her complete house completely lost her house lost everything she owned and he had too he had too his brother had him and his brother keith uh they sold their their shop over there on, on uh, pops ferry road not long ago but uh but that's the way he was and, and his saying was after he passed away uh his wife said one of his sayings was you never know who you're gonna feed you might feed jesus it didn't matter what was going on. What a thing to say, right? You never know who you're going to be helping. You might be helping Jesus. We entertain angels unawares. Sometimes God will send literal angels here on this earth to give us an opportunity to see what we're going to behave like. Sometimes he sends them to bless us. Sometimes he sends them to rescue us. And sometimes he sends them for us to have an opportunity to bless them. And when we're blessing them, we're blessing Him. Amen? Amen. I love that we are going to be rewarded according to our works. What we have done, we will be rewarded. There are many crowns being built up. Jesus says, don't build up uh, uh, rewards here on this <coughs> earth that, that moths can eat and, and the bags will get holes in it and lose all your money. Build up heaven, uh, money in heaven, right? Where no one can steal it away. Talking about Sonny, Stephen Scrimetto, one of the captains of the, the uh, oh, sorry, Ship Island Ferries, said this to me on the phone. said, Sonny was the greatest example of a Christian that he's ever known. My goodness. What a testimony. What a testimony, because they had known Sonny since they were little. In elementary school, they had known Sonny. He was his brother's best friend. Uh, and to have that said, that he was the greatest example of a Christian because of the things that he did, not just because of all the stuff that comes out of their mouth, but the things that he did, uh, 
I remember again when I was working out at Ingalls back in the late 70s, uh, <clears throat> some guys got saved on my crew. And boy, they were ramped up, always going around and telling everybody about the Lord and everything. Oh, they were so amazing. But then that's all they did all day. They wouldn't work. They did not do their work. All they did was go around and testify about Jesus and what he had done for them. And when they would leave, the people would say, yeah, and here I am having to work harder because you won't do your work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh boy. And I asked them, they would go down on the, the ground, we were on the ships, of course, working on the ships, and they would go down on the ground at lunchtime and have a prayer meeting, a, a teaching time. And I said, brothers, can I come and share the word with you? And I shared basically what we got here or something along the lines of this. And I told them, I said, we needed to be the best workers. We need to be there on time. We need to, to be in our work areas doing everything because we're going to give glory to God by what we do rather than just by words only. Faith without works is dead, right? If, how can you say if you've got faith if you're not doing the right thing is basically what I just said a few minutes ago. And they sat there and, amen, amen, brother. Oh, yeah, boy, okay. And it came about time for the go back to work. And I says, let's go, brothers. It's time to get back up there. Uh, we'll be along in a minute. No, man, you need to come now because it's time to go back to work. You're supposed to be in your work area. Now, we'll be up there in a few minutes. We're going to pray. I said, well, I'm going back to work, brother, because I need to be in my workstation. When it's time for that man to pay me to do work, I need to be there. They never got it. And all the word, all the words that they spoke were completely wasted because their actions spoke louder than their words. Had they been that on fire with their words, and doing the work ethic too, not stealing from their boss because they're getting paid for something they're not doing, then their, their testimony would have been awesome. Yes. It would have been awesome. But instead it was so tainted, no one heard a word that they had to say. I don't know as anyone that ever got saved. I didn't meet anyone that got saved from them. I met all of them that got mad, you know. I want to be known for being an example of Christianity. Yes. Not just a, a sayer, but a doer. Amen? Amen? That sounds like something we should yes. be striving for, and I'm going to leave that one up there. Sure. What a thing to be said. I want to know that there's a legacy, that there's something that people can hold on to. I want the reward at the end too, praise God. <laughs> because it gives him glory. He gives God glory. I don't doubt those guys. I hope they got changed. I mean, that's been 40 years ago, you know. I hope they got their life straightened out and, and started putting feet to their faith. But I know they'll be in heaven because their faith was there. Their faith was there completely. But they didn't do anything to back it up. Their, their, their testimony their witness was lost. So, I want to make sure that I can, and I just told Cindy this yesterday or day before, a couple nights ago, uh, I was praying over her, and uh, I said, you have eyes to see better than I see. And she has the ability to immediately work on it right there. She puts feet to it and says, Pray over. She's constantly going around to everyone, He's encouraging and lifting up and, and uh, saying, How are you doing? And, and she's looking and seeing what's going on and praying with them. That's the way we need to be li living our lives. Not looking at nitpicking yeah. and everything else. <laughs> I see what I'm, I'm going to help you out here. <laughs> I'm going to show you what you're doing wrong. Not the way it should be done. You show them what to do right instead of showing them what God is doing wrong. Well, let's go before the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. It's a joyful thing to walk in the word. 
it's a joyful thing because, Lord, we have more and more and more victory. Just like we sang, victory in Jesus, praise God. I have victory when I walk in the ways of the Lord. That you direct my paths, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us eyes to see, giving us ears to hear what our brother and sister is saying. Thank you for anointing the work of our hands to touch our brother and our sister, Lord God, as we go forth. To see the, the problems that they're having, see the things that they're going through, Lord God, and to move and do something, Lord God. Thank you for your anointing on our feet to go forth and carry out the word, Lord God. We thank you for this word here today, Lord. I receive it. We receive it. Say, I receive it. I receive it. Yes, Lord. Receive it, and I'll give you all the glory and the honor for it in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you God. If there's any in need of prayer, we're always happy.